podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome. It's a beautiful picture, I hope that you can see nice and clearly, uh, that shows, that starts up our presentation for today on the World Economic Forum. I got back on Saturday evening, so this is pretty fresh, hot off the press, if you like. Uh, and we've got a more beautiful presentation than ever in the past, thanks to the um, insights of Greg Beadle. Now, Greg is a, a photographer from Cape Town who uh, was brought into the WEF pool, the 13 photographers who cover it on behalf of the World Economic Forum. And he was flown all, all the way in from Cape Town. Of course, we uh, hit it off quite well. And Greg very kindly has given us uh, access to some excellent photographs that he took. But before we uh, get carried away on that side, let's just find out, Stuart, if everything is, is uh, technically the way it should be. Thanks a lot, Alec. Uh, yes, to all the listeners, can you please just raise your hands if you can hear Alec clearly and see the picture? That's excellent. So we've got some good sound there and visuals, Alec. I um, mean, just another thing, we like to keep the webinars very really sort of interactive. So as questions come to mind, please put them in the questions bar. It's on the right-hand control panel, there's a little drop-down menu questions. If you just plot them in there, I'll pass them on to Alec and we can get the conversation going quite nicely. Because I think it's a very conversational topic, this Davos thing, Alec. But I think everything's good, so over to you. Yeah, it, it, it is conversational. I'm sure that everybody knows that I am here and I am in London. Uh, and maybe, here we go, see a little bit of the background uh, from my office uh, in the, uh, on the South Bank. And there you go, you see, they have even London taxi cars. So <laughs> that's, that's where we are, uh, all dressed up for you today uh, with a jacket and tie on. And it, uh, it isn't something that Standard Bank insisted upon, I can assure you. Anyway, uh, welcome to the uh, Biz News Premium uh, subscribers uh, and also to the Standard Bank um, uh, uh, online trading or, or web trader client. We look forward to being in your company now for the next uh, about an hour or so. Uh, depending on how many questions come through. And uh, Stu, I just want to check with you. Can you see the presentation nice and clearly? Yes, it looks, it's a lovely picture there, Alec, of the part of the Alps I'm gathering. Very nice. All right. Good stuff. Right, let's get straight mm -hmm. into it. And uh, getting straight into it, um, this was the year of the snow. Now, I've been going to the World Economic Forum uh, since, well, I went the first time in 1993 and then was away for 10 years and then went again in uh, 2003. So if you like it, uh, if you like, it's been 25 years since my first visit there and a number, total number of 15 uh, WEFs that I've been to has never been snow like this before. That picture was taken by a kind uh, gent who was sitting next to me. As you can see, uh, I had to, I, I didn't have a place to sit. This is on the bus between a place called Landquart and Kublis. What happened was, unusually for Switzerland, there was so much snow that the train lines on the way to Davos were actually were closed down. It was just too much snow. Uh, there was uh, lots of concerns about avalanches, and the mayor of Davos was very concerned uh, that this was going to be a, um, a disaster, because as it is, you get thousands or tens of thousands of people who descend onto this uh, relatively small town during the last week in January. And... It's already a, a traffic clogged up, but when there is continuous snow, they can't even clear the roads. So you have, where well, you did have two lane roads, you now had single lane roads. It was a disaster for the first couple of days, but then thankfully the uh, sun came out. Those guys on the right hand side, I just had to take this photograph to show you. They are yogis. They came from India. Uh, India was very front and center in this uh, World Economic Forum. The um, president or rather Prime Minister Modi um, came in first time that a Indian head of state has been to the World Economic Forum in a couple of decades. He came in and left within 24 hours. So lots going on in his own country, but uh, a big Indian contingent and certainly for the beginning parts of Davos, they were um, much in the highlight. Many people are looking to India as being the next sensational driver for the global economy into the future. Davos itself, this is uh, going a few days into the uh, WEF. You can see the uh, nice blue sky, but one of the big things about it is always security. Uh, there are guards uh, posted. This guy doesn't look too heavily armed, but most of them are pretty uh, heavily armed, the policemen and the guards um, all around uh, the, the, the mountains and around the town itself. So it takes a while to get from point A to point B. 
uh, this year with Donald Trump arriving on the Thursday evening. It um, was a little bit more uh, stressful than before, but uh, this was just this is just a lovely picture of Greg's to show you um, the uh, the security levels that there are. That's a, a picture of what was happening on the Tuesday. Huge snowfalls, and uh, this area is where you walk into the Congress Center. As you can see with that little slide on the left-hand side, slippery floor. Uh, Gareth uh, von Sale and I uh, slipped a few times. Fortunately, not bad. Badly, we didn't. We didn't put. Uh, I think if you slip on this on these black ice, um, and particularly coming from South Africa, it it's not easy to negotiate. But uh, we managed to get through it. Unfortunately, there were quite a few people who did slip and fall. Also interesting the, this year, for the first time, I realised that the local people of Davos actually have a prayer meeting, which is a lovely touch, isn't it? They have for the full week, and it's been going for twenty years. Uh, people get together in a. a church, the, the locals, um, and they pray for the people, uh, for the WEF, that uh, the decisions that are taken are the right ones. It just shows that the whole town gets involved in this, not just those who are profiteering. And my goodness, are they profiteering. This is an indication of the commercialization of this little town. Uh, the crypt and also to explain it or to show to you how much the crypto and blockchain uh, has come. It, it wasn't really that strong on the agenda, but around uh, the uh, World Economic Forum, um, there were a number of these organizations, cryptocurrency organizations, Ethereum was there in full cry, uh, holding events throughout the uh, the five days of the World Economic Forum, took over shopping, uh, the shopping precinct. In fact, virtually all of the shops in this town along the what they call the promenade or the main street were closed and taken over by companies uh, because the shopkeepers can hire out their businesses and receive in two weeks rentals from companies like uh, these cryptos and they can receive a full year's rental so they do it they just the capers for two weeks take in uh, and take everything for the year paid. The, uh, the participants or the companies. This is a, a, a Thomson Reuters uh, display on your way to the Congress Center. Uh, deep snow there, uh, and you can stand and watch television if you want to on a, a very clear picture. Uh, Star Appeal always is at the World Economic Forum. One of the reasons why lots of people uh, go back year after year after year, uh, and that uh, is, is a, a very well known. Face, I hope to you, Kate Blanchett. Uh, she and Elton John, the musician, uh, were the uh, star attractions this year, as far, as far as the um, the entertainment industry was concerned. Um, both of them are involved in philanthropic exercises. As a result, they were awarded the Crystal Awards by the Schwab Foundation, which I guess is another way to ensure that you bring some really high-powered uh, glitterati. Uh, to make things even more attractive for those who attend. And those who attend are very well fed as well. The countries uh, tend to um, fall over themselves to show off their wares. This uh, was one of the lunches that had been arranged by a country. I think in this case, it was Saudi Arabia. Uh, interestingly enough, Saudi Arabia made sure that its lunch was just before Donald Trump spoke. So you had the bizarre situation of um, people staying filing into the Congress Center while standing and waiting to get into the Congress Center and uh, Arabic music um, fluting in the background at the same time. I don't know if they were sort of trying to send a message, but whatever it was, uh, this is, they, they pretty well looked after the delegates. But let's get on to what happened for South Africa, because that is the major uh, thrust for as far as I was concerned. I went there this year with a bit of a different agenda. This was a big year potentially for South Africa. We all knew this. Um, after the December the 18th elective ANC elective con uh, conference, Cyril Maposa uh, became the ANC president. And as happened in 2009, when Jacob Zuma became the ANC president, the ANC president, rather than the president of the country, goes to Davos to lead the team. Uh, the president of the country has, uh, he pulled out last year, three days before Jacob Zuma did. And in previous years, he's been um, pretty invisible at the WEF. Uh, I guess a little concerned about his bad press that he gets internationally and the kind of questions that he would be getting here. 
because the international media does not hold back in its questioning. In fact, uh, neither do the business executives nor the NGOs who attend here. And that's what makes this World Economic Forum so special, is that you get ATAR personalities in the room and nobody is, di is as diplomatic as you would expect them to be in a different scenario. Here, uh, they're all falling over each other to make a point. And South Africa this year was led by Cyril Ramaphosa, as it was last year. But last year, he was called off the bench with only three days to go. This year, he had a couple of weeks, and it was a very key event for South Africa. Didn't start too well, though. And uh, I want to just take you through a little bit of the um, developments in the, in the first couple of days. This happened on the Monday, the opening press conference from the International Monetary Fund. This is the very first time they've done it at the World Economic Forum. That is not Mr. Rice. That is uh, the head, the chief economist, Morris Obstfeldt. Uh, it's just the angle from which I took the photograph that uh, shows uh, shows him. And he then put on the table uh, the fact that the IMF has once again upgraded its global economic growth for the world. It went up by another two percentage points. So things are going very well. Cyclical upswing in the world. Uh, happy days all over uh, the world as it as it recovers from the global financial crisis. And continues on its negative in that South Africa was one of the few nations to be downgraded by the IMF. I asked him uh, in the uh, question and answer time after they'd uh, stated um, or done the, the, uh, the update. And incidentally, this always used to be done in Washington. They moved it from Washington to Davos this time for the for this year for the first time um, to up, update their um, the uh, forecasts, and that's, that just gives you another uh, indication of the pulling power of the World Economic Forum. I asked him why, uh, after the elective conference, uh, he's still, uh, or after the elective conference and Cyril Ramaphosa and already the statements that have been made about reforming uh, some of the bad economic policies, uh, whether they would be reassessing South Africa. He said he saw no reason to do so right now. And uh, he, he said, well, maybe in six months' time we can we can look at it again. But a very negative response from the IMF, pretty much a question of we're not buying it. Similarly, we had on the right-hand side, that is Bob Moritz, who is the chairman of uh, PwC every year, uh, just ahead of Davos. This is on the Monday night. PwC releases its CEO survey, a very important uh, document. It uh, is compiled after interviews, in-depth interviews with 1,300 chief executives around the world. And once uh, again, the outlook for the world as a whole is very bullish. It was the uh, CEOs have never been as confident as they were in this survey when they, they came. Uh, everything hit new records. Bob Moritz was, uh, was, was pleasantly surprised, he said, by pretty much everything that came through accepting South Africa and Africa. Uh, I got hold of him afterwards and uh, had a very interesting interview. It's well worth listening to. It's on the uh, Biz News site, of course. Uh, and in that interview, he said that Africa, uh, the chief executives are concerned about corruption, uh, infrastructure, and the ability of Africa to leapfrog. They aren't seeing anything, anything like that happening. They have got many other alternatives around the world, and they don't see Africa getting onto that list of the top 10 investment destinations anytime soon. I asked him about South Africa. He too, just like uh, the CEO of the uh, Morris Obsted, uh, Obsfeld was, uh, was non-committal and said, well, you know, they will take a wait and see approach. It's the 21st time that PwC brought out this survey. So those two uh, didn't exactly fill me with lots of excitement, as you can imagine. And then this really brought a lead balloon into the situation. Uh, this is a guy on the left-hand side there is uh, Richard Edelman. The Edelman's Trust Barometer is, the, is one of the most prestigious of the surveys that is brought out anywhere in the world uh, annually. What it does is it has a look at the trust that the public have, and they call them the informed public and the uninformed public. Uh, they, they break that up by the amount of uh, uh, consumption of uh, media, etc. And how much trust the public has in business, in NGOs, in government, and in the media. So they have a look at those four categories, put them all together, and give them a rating. And this year, the, the trust in the United States from the informed public was, was absolutely imploded. Now, the informed public were primarily the people who voted for Hillary, okay. Uh, but as you can see there, last year, the United States was uh, ranked very highly. It was at, at 68 points. 
This year, it went down to 45. And the comment, and this was what staggered me a little, the comment from the panelists was, America has fallen even below South Africa, as though we were the bottom scrapers of the barrel of the 28 countries. And of course, we were. There we are. South Africa second last, United States uh, stone last. In fact, uh, we've dropped from uh, uh, just off the last year with a rating of 49 down to a rating of 45. So it shows you how badly South Africa is perceived going into Davos. Remember, this survey was done between mid-October mid and mid-November, so long ahead of the ANC elective conference and ahead of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa's um, appearance here. This uh, emphasizes that all uh, of the 28 countries, their trust in government, uh, in 16 of them, it improved. Uh, it's interesting to see China is right at the top there uh, with a, a good increase in the level of trust, as is South Korea. They got rid of their, their president, President Park, who was, uh, well, uh, apparently corrupt. But the United States fell back sharply. As you can see, they had the biggest decline there, minus 14 points. And who's bottom of the table? But in quite some way, even behind Brazil, down a percent of South Africans trust its government. Again, that is going into the World Economic Forum um, uh, meetings. This is on the Tuesday morning. So if you're looking at all of these things, Cyril Ramaphosa, or as a South African, you've got to be you've got to be scratching your head and thinking my goodness we've got a lot of work to do which we know everybody in the country does know that but uh, this really emphasizes the the size of the challenge however on wednesday the sun came out and it's a beautiful little town when the sun is uh, shining rather than when the uh, when when the snow is there and almost uh, as soon as the sun came out i hope you guys are enjoying these pictures by the way um uh, we had this uh, cartoon uh, in Daily Maverick by Zapiro, and it is just so apt. Now, uh, Jonathan Shapiro, who is better known as Zapiro, has been a regular visitor to the World Economic Forum. He's regarded as uh, something of a star in Davos when he does go there. He wasn't there this year, but he knows the setup. He knows how things work. And as you can see, uh, he talks here of the Cyril Spring. Well, he wasn't the only one talking about that. It became uh, a little bit of a phenomenon after a, a period of time. Started off on the Wednesday uh, where Cyril was in a closed meeting for potential investors in South Africa. Now, let me just bring you up to date on what's been going on. Towards um, the middle of January, Goldman Sachs, which is the, the most powerful investment bank on Wall Street, issued a report, its annual report, having a look at emerging markets, and it rated South Africa as the hottest emerging market in the world. This was done in the wake of uh, December the 18th elective conference when Sir Maposa was appointed. Goldman Sachs is uh, very well planned to the South African economy. Indeed, the South African uh, chief, Colin Coleman, who is, uh, who is from the country, uh, is, is a regular attendee in, in all Team South Africa events, and he was at the World Economic Forum this year. His, his summary, I did a, a dual, dual interview with him and Jeffrey Quinn from the IDC, two of the smartest guys you, you're going to listen to, um, their summary of the event, which is up on business this morning as well, worth listening to as well. But at this event, what was most interesting was that last year, pretty much no one, was, no one went along to it. You had a few South Africans there uh, on the, um, this is a private in, event for institution best. But this year, they couldn't accommodate. It wasn't big enough to accommodate everyone who wanted to go there. It was oversubscribed um, and advised by Cyril Ramaphosa. And suddenly, things started catching fire. Uh, he said later in the week that he was managing to have 20, he was doing at least 20 interviews or engagements per day. Now, if you work that out into a normal eight-hour day, you'll see that that doesn't even get you uh, to 15 minutes an hour. Uh, as a consequence um, uh, of this, uh, he worked long and hard. But the real hit that uh, we saw came at the Wednesday evening. Every Wednesday evening, Brand South Africa uh, hosts a dinner at this venue. This is called the Kirshner Museum. As you can see, it's well branded by the, the country. And in it takes over. There's Brand South Africa's HQ is in this um, in this area so if you are in Davos and you want to go and see a friendly face you just pop into the Kirshner Museum and you'll see 
um, uh, scarves, uh, or South African branded scarves, and and there's always a cup of tea for you there. So it's 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 a nice place to pop into regularly. On a Wednesday night, though, they have a dinner. Last year, uh, Cyril uh, hosted the dinner. The Pravin Gordon was there. Uh, remember, he was still finance minister then. So much has changed in the past year. Uh, the uh, dinner last year was was hopeful, perhaps, but primarily only South Africans. This year, they asked the to bring a foreign girl in London, and uh, he was very impressed. And the reason why he was suitably impressed, as were pretty much, um, I guess, any other of the foreign ge foreign guests who were there, um, is because of uh, this man. Now, this was one of the most impressive engagements or, or, or talks that I've ever heard. He stood as uh, as one normally does at the other end of the room where the podium was. As you can see, full house, South African and foreign guests um, at the Brand South Africa dinner. Last year, it was probably half full. Well, three quarters full, maybe. The year before, half full. Uh, just, it was, it was, they really struggled to fill the room. This year, they had to bring in extra tables. But after a little while, after uh, introducing himself, he went what we called at Biz News off-piste. And uh, sort of took the microphone and started getting closer, walking down. Uh, to where everybody was sitting rather than everybody looked up at him. And uh, and then completely uh, off script for 35 minutes, he spoke. And he spoke from the heart and he explained exactly what was on his mind and where the priorities were for the country and what he intended doing about it. And really, uh, uh, what <laughs> I had the good fortune, actually, of, or a little bit surprisingly because of your sleep deprivation at a, at a place like WEF, uh, I switched on my phone uh, to record it. And we then had the, uh, the, the address transcribed and put it up on Business News and it's had 80,000 reads, which in our business is, is pretty big. Uh, it's a lot of people who, who've actually read what Sora Ramaphosa had to say, given that he was talking um, off script. The last time we did something like this or saw something like this was when President Zuba spoke off script a few years ago and made a complete hash of things uh, when he said that Africa is such a big place, all the other continents would fit into it and that it, uh, all the other continents had a river and Africa didn't and so on. And made, really just made a mess um, in denial, if you like, uh, of the realities of the world. This time around, you had a superlative contribution. And I, I would uh, urge you to go and read the transcript or go and listen to um, the president in waiting of South Africa. And he really focused on three things. He said, the policy inconsistency is the is we are giving the message to foreign investors here in, in, in Davos that that has to be addressed. We are going to address corruption. There will be no mercy for those people who have been corrupt. They will be uh, forced to face the consequences. And it was almost like um, he was urging those who have been part of the network of corruption to come forward and have their state, uh, state their case. And interestingly enough, in the morning before this address, we got the terms of reference for the investigation into state capture. And those are pretty much as uh, the former public protector, Tuli Madonsela, uh, had them outlined uh, in the past. It was one of the big problems uh, for observers on the investigation into state capture by the Deputy Chief Justice is the, the terms of reference. Well, those have been uh, spot on and very consistent with the message that Tura Maposa was giving here. And the third thing he said was we need to address state-owned enterprises. And the work that has already been done at Eskom flows from his personal involvement and driving of that process. Part of the reason for that, he, he told us uh, this evening, was that he had received a memo from 400 managers, senior managers at Eskom, to say the place was in big trouble, please, he needed to intervene. He said that he also, um, while he was uh, in the pre-divorce uh, gathering with chief executives and other South African delegate people, um, one of the chief executives stood up and said, Mr. Ramaphosa, you needn't even go to divorce if you don't do anything about Eskom, because Eskom is on the brink, and people know that around the world. Remember, Eskom has funded a lot of its uh, uh, capital investments from foreigners. It, uh, Eskom bonds are, are traded all over the world. And as a consequence of that, he said that if you don't get this thing fixed up, you're not going to be, uh, you, you may as well not go to Davos. And the third thing um, Cyril shared with us this evening, he said that he was walking with his daughter and uh, there was a guy running 
doing his his, uh, his exercise and he stopped he said uh, he introduced himself as a uh, he said this young man worked in the capital department of Eskom, and he said mr deputy president you really really have to do something about Eskom. things are on a knife edge there it's it, we're in big trouble and so the consequence of a lot of the degree we've seen the very competent um, Jabu Mabuza being appointed as chairman of the uh, state-owned enterprise and where Eskom goes others will follow of that you can be certain so that was his message really uh, his message to the South African delegation which he repeated in those 20 plus meetings a day with um, leading uh, investment bankers and foreign investors who are looking at South Africa and the message is we are going to address the inconsistency in our policies uh, one of the big ones there is the MPRDA, and you might be aware that uh, that's to do with minerals and resources. We've got the mining in Darba coming up in uh, in the next few days. In fact, it starts next week. So something's going to happen between now and next week to give the miners the uh, insights and, or the, the belief that this is a new South Africa with policy certainty. Secondly, corruption, and we've already seen the Hawks uh, doing some uh, rather interesting raids. Uh, and the third thing is the state-owned enterprises. So Ramaphosa is talking a, 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 a to whose, whose ears uh, it, it is absolute music. Um, of course, he's already starting to follow through. People will not believe it until things happen, but uh, he has certainly begun uh, on that. And the people who do believe it are those uh, who are in Davos and those are the, the power um, mongers if you like, uh, who, who have the ability uh, to change our fortunes. This was the press conference, again, where the message was once more totally consistent. So it wasn't a complicated message. It was a consistent message to say, we've made mistakes. The governing party understands that it has, uh, that it has got problems, that we will not uh, brush them under the carpet. In the past, there was only a perception that there was corruption. Uh, we spoke about it, but we didn't really believe it. We are now we've now grasped the nettle, and we are addressing the corrupt practices. Um, and uh, this was the it was a consistent message that came from all of those who were at the uh, press conference. And as you can see, Sir Ramaphosa there uh, giving his um, making a point or two. What I found uh, most interesting about the press conference was uh, the chat that I had with Rob Davies, the Minister of Trade and Industry afterwards, where uh, I did ask a question um, during the press conference. Uh, how have you guys found the difference between 2017 and 2018 in Davos? And they all said they, they, uh, they, it, was, it was almost like being in a different, a different universe. Um, 2017, no real interest in South Africa. 2018, uh, run off their feet. And the way... Rob David, was he said last year, those who uh, sought him out to have uh, discussions with him were actually just wanting to complain. They were, they were, um, uh, they wanted him to try and fix little niggles that they had. Um, and many of them were uh, unhappy and that they had investment in South Africa, but they, as it was there, they kind of had to make the best of it and so on. He said this year, without exception, those who met with him and he had a very busy schedule he said that he was sought out by many people he hadn't seen for a while uh, was that they wanted to either expand their existing investments in south africa or to bring new money into the country that's extraordinary when these hard-headed businessmen uh, who do sail underneath the radar but do keep an eye on what is happening in the global arena and where their investments are when they come to uh, cabinet ministers of a country with a with a message that is so dramatically different you've got to know that something big is happening on the ground and uh, next week i'll be or in the next couple of weeks i'll be in south africa going around the country to talk about why it's a good time to invest in sa inc this is one of the uh, big reasons for it another uh, thing there's sir ramaphosa again leaving the press conference like to see this uh, often the the state leaders are followed by um I mean, up to a dozen, sometimes even more hangers on who shield them or protect them from the rest of the of the of the world. And here is Ramaphosa sitting on a golf cart, 
uh, after his press conference, off he goes to his next appointment. It just <laughs> kind of gives you, and by the way, I asked them, please slow down, I'd like to take a photograph. And that's why they're all <laughs> laughing at it. Uh, they actually stopped and, uh, and well, the fellow who's driving there, he does that uh, during the whole of Davos. He goes up and down. That's all he does is he drives his golf cart to the top and brings him down to the media center. But as you can see, a very confident, very happy, and a, a very excited um, South Africa Inc. Uh, a terrific photograph here of um, of Sora Ramaphosa by Greg Beadle. And if you were a man from Mars and you came down and you you saw this gentleman, you'd have to say, man, he's running a, he's intelligent, he's articulate, he speaks off the cuff, uh, he has a great feel for global economics. He's got to be the he's got to be the star of the show. But in fact, he wasn't. This guy was the star of the show. It was quite extraordinary. Donald Trump arrived in Davos. Uh, to all kinds of uh, conflicting messages, but he did bring. Remember, this is this is the ultimate protectionist. He's put America first. He's uh, he's he's fighting free trade. He's pulled out of a, a couple of trade agreements already. He suggests that he would like to pull out of NAFTA as well, North American Free Trade Agreement. That's between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and a few others. Um, he he's really a blinkered approach towards towards globalization. Uh, He's on the other side of the fence. And Davos, and you see to Trump's left, there is a Klaus Schwab, and his wife Hilda Schwab is on the far left. Uh, Davos is all about the World Economic Forum, is all about globalization, it's all about open societies, it's all about uh, promoting uh, integration around the world. Of course, Trump is the opposite. So, what would you expect? You'd expect uh, Trump to arrive and to be either shunned or ignored. It was precisely the opposite. Now, whether this was because of a curiosity factor or whether it's because he just has this magnetic star appeal matters not he left stood uh, uh, came into the this was on the thursday afternoon by the way uh, when i was asked but somebody asked ramaphosa uh, whether he was staying for donald trump's address uh, he said he would be leaving on thursday night as did many other uh, global leaders. But many of the delegates at the World Economic Forum waited for the Friday morning address. And when Trump came in there, literally, people stood four deep to get a glimpse of this man. And uh, as he was uh, walking into the center, he, he brought, by the way, 10 cabinet ministers from the US cabinet. One of the journalists shouted out and said, Trump, you're not welcome in Davos. And this was the picture that Greg took immediately afterwards. And he opened his hand. He says, what do you mean? Look around you. <laughs> I guess he's got a point on that one. Because there were, uh, well, it, it, it really was a star attraction. Um, and a beautiful picture that, that Greg picked. Bonang Mokhale, uh, who is the head of business leadership South Africa, has been very outspoken uh, on uh, numerous issues, particularly on corruption in South Africa. He's pretty outspoken about Trump as well. and uh, he called for a boycott and he was uh, all over the international news uh, as a result of that and indeed most Africans did boycott the Donald Trump uh, speech primarily because of the comments that he allegedly made um, in a meeting with the Democrats where he called the South Africa and other uh, or Africa the entire Africa Haiti and El Salvador shithole country, uh, countries and he hasn't apologized for it uh, and Bonang felt that it was the right thing to do not to attend the speech. Well, uh, uh, being a journalist, that wasn't uh, on my agenda. So I went and stood in the queue and you can see there, this is half an hour before Donald Trump was due to speak. And look at the queue behind me. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward towards the, uh, the Congress hall and that's the queue behind. It was a crush as people just uh, were desperate to get into a um, plenary hall which holds about two and a half thousand people. Anyway, uh, so as the story turned out, uh, I got to the front of the queue and uh, I have a, this year I had a media badge and they explained uh, that that wasn't good for getting into. I had to go through a specific media entrance. Um, and so after half an hour of, of being jostled and squashed and everything else, uh, I needed to be told to be turned away. Uh, was a little unfortunate. I went off to the other side, and uh, by then there were only 150 
uh, seats that had been reserved for media and those clearly had been taken long ago. So uh, that meant that I had to, <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't in there and um, then I was, I was uh, following Bonang's uh, uh, boycott recommendation, but uh, of course not, uh, not willingly. Um, just because I couldn't get into the hall, but it gives you an indication of the star appeal of the man. Not everybody was uh, was uh, as starstruck. These two gents um, were having a nice uh, smoothie and a, and a chat, and it was good to chat with Leseja Kanyaho, uh, the Reserve Bank Governor. Uh, this was while Trump's speech was being made, and he mentioned uh, to me that he'd also been uh, he, he would regard this as the most successful uh, World Economic Forum that he's had in many a year. Last year, he said uh, people met with him out of politeness, out of courtesy. He said this year, they sought him out. This year, they were looking for him. People from all over the world, um, other central bankers, other bankers, etc., cetera, um, were very, very keen to get into his diary, to have conversations with him. There is an excitement. There is a buzz about South Africa's delegation, not just at the World Economic Forum, but because of the transformation that is uh, happening in the political environment. And uh, he's there with Kailetu Ngema, uh, who's uh, with Transnet, and uh, also talking about, in, in well, most of it was off the record. You don't really want to let too much of this out, but um, talking about the excitement that exists within his organization as well at the transformation that we're seeing. But getting back to Donald Trump, uh, this was where I was uh, standing outside. Uh, Greg came out to, to to take a photograph of it as well. So remember, you've got Trump inside the plenary session uh, talking to a full audience. And here is the uh, a television screen outside. And you can see people are actually taking photographs of, of uh, the video screen. What did he say? Well, it was pretty much... Um, what one might have expected, he's America first, he, he doesn't like China, uh, that we know. Uh, he would talk tough on uh, going against China because of the way that he perceives that they're stealing intellectual property uh, and they are subsidizing their exports. Um, as you might be aware, America has recently put duties onto Chinese exports, so the, the beginnings of a trade war are being seen there as well. He was the, the speech was very tightly scripted, written by uh, Gary Kahn, who's the former uh, boss at uh, or one of the former bosses at Goldman Sachs, who's now very close to Trump and, and helping him to understand or at least put out the right message uh, to the world. And uh, it, it said pretty much what you might have thought. I thought it was underwhelming. Uh, some of the international media were uh, impressed and certainly in the Hall itself, from what we could see on television, um, the people who were at the event uh, were quite impressed because they they clapped for him afterwards. Interestingly enough, when he arrived in Davos, um, where we were standing four deep, and he was asked by uh, a journalist that he's or suggested by a journalist that he's unwelcome, at that point in time, uh, Donald Trump, uh, there was no clap, there was no cheer, there was no boo, there was nothing. It was like silence, which was very strange. You had this this huge crowd looking on at a man who stopped as an emperor would have in the Roman days, I guess, and waved at the crowds. Didn't see too many people waving back, but no one said a word. This time, however, when he was in the Congress Center, uh, after his speech, there was, uh, there was clapping. And from what you could see on the video, people, at least in the first few rows, gave him a standing ovation. So it's an interesting uh, contrast to um, how Trump was perceived here. Once he went off script, he wasn't quite as good as, uh, as well, he wasn't anywhere near as good as when he was reading from his script. He had three uh, teleprompters in front of him, and, and uh, uh, having been in the television industry for a while, uh, I, I, you can you pick these things out. They're highly sophisticated. Now, it's kind of a perspex screen with the words that you can read from it. So as he turns his head across, you can see that he's reading from the teleprompter. Um, but then... After he'd uh, had his speech, he was asked a couple of questions by Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum chairman, and he wasn't, wasn't quite as tight and as uh, focused during that uh, engagement, claiming, strangely, that the stock market boom, uh, the US market is up 50% since he was elected. And he is taking total credit for that. He said if Hillary had been elected rather than him, the stock market would be down 50%. But those are the kind of Trump statements that we've come to um, 
uh, to be used to, and anybody who uh, gainsays it uh, is told that they are or participating in fake news. And that is the uh, is the feedback from the World Economic Forum. There were there were three other big things that that perhaps are just worth dwelling on quickly. The the one is this was the year when I saw blockchain coming more and more and more onto the agenda. Uh, cyber currencies people at the World Economic Forum are, uh, or who were there, um, did say that cyber currencies were in a bubble and that the bubble would governments would um, try to uh, regulate it at the very least as they had done through history uh, and that it, it, really, it really was a dangerous game that those people who were buying Bitcoin um, or some of the other cyber currencies were playing. There were many of these questions in sessions and uh, from the IMF through to uh, some of the others, other areas or some of the other press conferences that I attended, it appeared as though the public wanted to know or the, the, the participants and the media wanted to know about, more about what's going on with cyber currencies and Bitcoin. Uh, uh, but the participants dismissed it and they felt that uh, maybe we've got a change here. We've got the, uh, the status quo being challenged. It's, it's, uh, it is, however, something that uh, a lot of people are paying attention to. So those are, those are another issue. The, the big issue for South Africa um, is that the country is being perceived after a dreadful start uh, that was turned around, turned on a ticky, as you, you, you might um, remember the old saying. And there was a, uh, a, a great interest in the country and a great belief that Cyril Ramposa is going to be making a huge difference to it. We'll see the next installment will be at the mining in Daba. That should be an interesting one. And the third point on all of uh, to come out of it, the big thing, is that the global economy is in an excellent, excellent shape. Uh, it is in a cyclical upswing, true. And those countries that have not uh, done reforms, uh, structural reforms, and have allowed themselves to still be in the same situation that they were in, uh, going back to the time of the uh, global financial crisis, are going to be in trouble, but the countries, sorry, aren't going to be in trouble, the, the ones who've done the reforms, but the countries who have not reformed are going to be finding the, the, the going tough. South Africa is in the latter category. In other words, it hasn't reformed its economy, hasn't used uh, the difficulties of the past few years to, do, to get things right. In fact, it was on a completely weird um, path, but it has now got somebody there who is uh, is prepared to uh, to implement the national development plan. Something else that I haven't mentioned as well, aligned to this, is Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean president, Emerson Nangangwa, was there as well. Also had lots of meetings, lots of interest in him. Uh, I spoke to him uh, on the phone to try and uh, set up uh, a meeting, which I had been promised. But by the time uh, he was able to 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 really assess this. Uh, he was so inundated with foreign investors and others who needed to see him or wanted to see him that uh, we could, uh, I was quite happy to, to step back because obviously there's there, there are bigger priorities. Uh, so I didn't get my meeting with the Zimbabwean president, maybe next time. That's the, uh, the, the, the wrap up of the World Economic Forum. Stuart, uh, if there are any questions, should we get to them now? Yes. Excellent, thanks, Alec. Uh, Two questions from Andrew. He says, it goes back to the, it's on SA. He says, is, is SA in a turnaround or do we need to wait for more proper signs? And then just off that he wants to know, what was the feeling around the UK, obviously with Brexit and et cetera, from the World Economic Forum? As far as South Africa is concerned, um, it is, hmm, if you recall during the time of Codessa, uh, as you can see, I've got a bit of gray hair. So I was around then, before Codessa started, there were talks about talks, Cadesa being the talk, so there were talks about the talks. And it's a little bit like that. There's talks about uh, um, the action that's going to be taken. The action has started, and South Africa's economic turnaround will be stimulated by the decisions that are taken today. So it's almost like if you, if, if the higher up the totem pole one goes uh, in an organization, if you're a country or within a company, uh, the higher up the totem pole, the longer it takes for the decisions that you make to be felt on the ground. South Africa, however, has stopped going down. It's the, the, the decisions that have been made recently 
uh, on um, attacking the corrupt uh, or charging the corrupt people on changing um, the the management at state-owned enterprises on addressing the policy uncertainty all of those things are ideas or issues that have been keeping money away from the country now that you address those issues investors will come back into the country and there is a massive amount of goodwill towards south africa more so this being nelson mandela's uh, he would have been 100 this year so it would have been the 100th anniversary of his of his death so it's an opportunity for south africa to re, uh, of his birth rather an opportunity for south africa to really use it and that mandela's uh, anointed one has actually uh, is poised to take over as president of the country so all of that good thing uh, it, it it puts the country in a good place but also the fact that it's the ruling party is no longer in denial it has accepted uh, what the issues are and it's it's um, hell-bent on addressing them that's that is music to the ears of foreign investors so south africa is the economy turning around yet no of course not these it can't just uh, because we will it to happen but you've got to understand that the the um elevated emotions and if you you're in South Africa, I'm sitting here in London, but uh, from all of the engagements that I have with people that, uh, back home, the, the feeling is that the emotions are being elevated. Cyril says that he's going to appoint patriotic, capable South Africans who love their country and uh, do not want to um, put their families and themselves first because there's a huge turnaround to, be, to happen. As you see those appointments going through and uh, more and more you'll see the, the uh, high caliber of, of person being put into important roles within um, the, the governing structures in the country, you will see the, uh, the impact that they will have. Because when you are leveraging a, a tired old machine like this, or, or a machine that's been going downwards, you have low hanging fruit, you have very, very quick wins to be made. So it, it's likely that you'll see that in the short term. Of course, the RAND uh, tells it all, doesn't it? The share price of South Africa, uh, which has rocketed since uh, Ramaphosa came uh, into office below 12 to the US dollar it was worse than 14. As far as the UK is concerned, it was pretty much, it was very quiet, surprising enough. Theresa May did speak. Um, she had uh, polite uh, applause. She said very much the stuff that she's been saying throughout, uh, good, solid. Uh, we, we, we believe in the rule of law. Uh, we believe in a rules-based um, trade. Uh, we believe in in all the good things that democracies uh, propose, we also believe in in, in an exit uh, from uh, the European Union that will be uh, measured and and uh, done responsibly and sensibly. And the UK delegation again, they they would have been happy with her competent uh, management of of the uh, of the global community, but there was nothing to change any opinions one way or the other. Thanks, Alec. Um, two questions on the trust barometer that you mentioned from Edelman. Um, we actually found out that Trevor Forfan actually resides in Sweden. He wants to know why they're so low, as well as Japan from Dion. They just, he doesn't understand, quite understand it. He says, as a comment, he said, would it be that they're selling inappropriate airplanes to USA? But I think that's just an off-the-cuff joke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the sales of of uh, of plants to, to South Africa would certainly not not uh, rank uh, here. It's an interesting survey. This thirty three thousand people are uh, polled around the year. It's been uh, around the world. It's been going uh, for over a decade, well over a decade now. Um, why are they? Uh, why is Japan so low? Did you say Sweden? Sweden's not yeah, bad. Sweden and Japan. Sweden's above Australia, above Spain, above Germany, above. <laughs> Okay. That's uh, that, that's not bad. I, I would have thought. Um, we'd love to see South Africa up there. Uh, and indeed, it, it biggest change in the last year. If you have a look on the right hand side, there it says uh, United States down twenty three, but Argentina and Sweden up. So clearly, Sweden is lifting its head again and um, and getting into a better position uh, relative to to market. I just. Um, uh, Makri, the new president there, uh, who a former mayor of Buenos Aires and a, a former businessman, who's doing amazing things in Argentina. So there's a there's an upliftment. It's almost like what you see is 
what's happening in Tina is the potential for South Africa to see this uh, this significant improvement. But as far as Japan's concerned, well, it's there's, there should be no surprises there. Japan just can't get out the starting blocks. They've thrown money at, at the economy. Um, they've tried everything they can, the government this is, and they just can't get going. They can't get the economy growing. So that's part of the reason why uh, the informed public in Japan don't really trust Abe and, and the other uh, leaders. You can see Russia and Poland uh, also on that graph down towards the bottom. Thanks, Eric. A question from Aurit Thiele um, asks, do you think Cyril is waiting on the outcome of the state capture inquiry to remove some of the top six that are implicated? I ask because it would be hypocritical, it would be hypocritical of him if he were to continue working together with those implicated. Yeah, it's a really good question, and I wish I had an answer for you. Uh, my own my own feeling on this is that Cyril Ramaphosa is displaying this brilliantly. Uh, he's not trying to, uh, or let's put it differently, in Europe uh, or in other parts of some other parts of the world, when one of your leaders might have previously been highly esteemed uh, has a misstep or, or goes in the wrong direction. There's no compunction from the communities there to proverbially chop his head off and uh, and to display the head to uh, to the masses as a, a person who was all bad. Of course, nobody's all bad or all good, and, and many people were pretty good in the past. Uh, as far as Sir Ramaphosa's con uh, or as far as Africa's concerned, there's a far more dignified approach towards this kind of. Uh, dismissal, if you like, of the leaders. If you even have a look at the way that the Zimbabwean um, government, the new Zimbabwean government and the Zimbabwean people have treated Robert Mugabe, who almost single-handedly has been uh, been responsible for, at least in the last 20 years, an imploding economy that's, that's shrunk to a fraction of the size of, of what it was before he took over. He's been treated with dignity because he made a huge contribution to the the country at a time when they really needed him to. One shouldn't forget that the ANC is still a liberation party. It has still got leaders who have sacrificed enormously uh, in the past. Jacob Zuma was in jail for 10 years. He was on Robert Island for, for 10 years, whatever else he's done subsequent to that. And people's memories are, are longer in Africa. So Cyril Ramaphosa will have a, he has a tricky task. Everybody knows that corruption, everybody knows the ANC has lost its way. He admits it, as does uh, any other rational person in working within the ANC. The best way to address this is not to get personal, is to allow the law to take its course. And that's the smartest way of addressing it. So he cannot now go against uh, those who voted for the top six and suddenly fire, I, I don't even know if, if the constitution allows him to do that, uh, those who have been appointed to those positions. But what he can do is he can have the law interrogate whether or not these people are uh, suitable to be holding those positions. And that's exactly what is going on now. I don't think he phoned up the head of the Hawks and said, go and uh, look into the Frieda farm and uh, raid Ace Magashulu's, Magashulu's office that's just not his style. But what he will do is he will most certainly, um, as Nelson Mandela would have done, uh, give the authority and support the authorities or the institutions who have the responsibility for doing those ki that kind of work. So I don't know what's going on in his, in his head, but I do know from what we heard from him and uh, from his very clear and very direct approach is that those who have been corrupted uh, are, are going to pay the penalty. I, I, I pressed quite a few of the cabinet ministers in both formal and informal discussions. And the response that I got, because my thought was, well, perhaps it's time for South Africa to have another Truth and Risk Reconciliation Commission, another TRC, where those who uh, have, uh, and have, have done the wrong thing, uh, who are corrupted, can come up and admit and get on with their lives, and we can all get on with it with our lives. Um, the response was no. Uh, corruption is a crime, and if we don't deal with it properly, as the law says we should be dealing with it, then we are sending a message to the next generation, which will be a very unfortunate one because it would put us onto the wrong path. So, 
you can expect the uh, many newspaper headlines. You can expect lots of drama. You can expect um, uh, lots of, of, of excitement around this. But the reality is the wheels of justice grind slowly, but they grind very finely. And we can trust in the South African institutions. They have been stress tested. They have held up. They have not been uh, subjugated by uh, the forces of evil. And they will be coming more and more into their own in this regard. Of course, the big question here is how many people are going to go into the telltale or the tattletale room, as, as Paul O'Sullivan calls it, because there's only so much space. Uh, you can't, not everybody can turn state's witness. Uh, both uh, Bonang Mukhale and um, some of the other people that I spoke to uh, and in Davos said that they, they've been inundated with whistleblowers or people who are coming out of the woodwork now who were involved in these networks of corruption. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a free for all to see who can tell the most and prove the most so that they can get the most immunity or uh, I guess uh, suspended sentences or, or light jail sentences. We're into this process now. And that is what's going to determine the future of politicians, as well as people in business, as well as people in society. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Gavin just wants to know, was there anything said with regards to the infrastructure and water infrastructure, sorry, in particular with Cape Town, obviously, and it's day zero, fast approaching. He says, obviously, yep. it's an important city, as well as there's problems in the eastern and northern Cape. So he just wants to know if anything was addressed. Gavin, yes, we did ask at the press conference. Uh, in fact, that was one of my questions, was to ask specifically what is going on with water in the Western Cape. And uh, central government says they're, doing, they, 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 they're on it, if you like. They couldn't really give us much more detail. But whereas in the past you might have accused central government of some kind of politicking, uh, these guys, or the guys who are now uh, calling the shots, uh, are not doing that at all. They're very, they're very concerned about it, and they are addressing it. That's about as much as as we got from them. Thanks, Alec. Um, Costa wants to know: Do you think enough was done to spare South Africa a downgrade by Muni's next month? I think so. I think so. I think Moody's is going to listen to the mood. They're going to listen to what's being promised, and they are going to take uh, the, the turnaround in attitude uh, for, for what it means. And it, it does mean there's going to be action. If, however, we come in six months' time and there's been very little done, uh, then Moody's would almost certainly do the downgrade. But remember, it's on negative watch. Watch was put there ahead of the ANC elective conference. You do have almost a change in government uh, within the ANC with the one grouping, uh, the Zuma affiliated grouping, who, who had a different economic agenda and a very poorly managed one, as we can see from all the statistics and the rise in debt, et cetera, uh, a, a misguided one. They're out of the picture. And the people who are in the picture now are very aware uh, of the potential of the country and what needs to be done. And to align it within sensible economic policies. The interesting thing about all this is as much as, as, as we hate the legacies of colonialism and apartheid and, and issues that have put South Africa and Africa indeed on the back foot, there, there is only one economic law. There are not many laws in economics. You can't say, well, okay, so let's try communism because or socialism because maybe the Russians just didn't do it properly. Uh, we'll get it right this time. That's not the way economics works. Economics works in, in, on the basis that you can only spend what you earn uh, and you can't, if you keep spending what you don't earn and you borrow to do that, eventually there will be a day of reckoning. That's the reality of it. And what is, what Cyril uh, Ramaphosa and his team are now going towards is exactly aligned with what Moody's and the other ratings agencies have been saying, and the International Monetary Fund, by the way, and the Reserve Bank, South African Reserve Bank, uh, have been saying, uh, these are the economic laws, let's just abide by them. Uh, and uh, it could, I don't know, of course, I mean, I don't know what's going through Moody's minds, but they have shown an ability to listen and to give South Africa the benefit of the doubt, even in incredibly difficult circumstances. Uh, this is now a circumstance where one would hope that they don't continue to punish the country for past sins and, and that they once again give it the benefit of the doubt. 
Thanks, Alan. Uh, a few questions on the RAND. Um, I'll just sum it up. Has, it ex has the RAND strength exceeded the high, or do you think there's room for further strength? I know, I know you don't normally forecast, but there's some thoughts around the RAND. Yeah, I, I'm, I think uh, I remember a very wise man once said to me, uh, the person who signs a surety is a fool with a pen. Uh, I think that the person who predicts the RAND is uh, in the same category. The RAND, although we did we did say just ahead, and those of you who were who, who followed the webcast with the uh, global portfolio last month, um, ahead of the ANC elected conference, we we did say we we believed that the right thing would happen and that Cyril would be uh, would be elected and that the RAND would rebound strongly. But it didn't make any sense for us to to sell out the whole portfolio just to take benefit of that. That would be trading. Uh, when it comes to the RAND. It is now into a bullish um, period. Whether it's overshot in the short term, uh, time will only time will tell us. But even um, by by most uh, criteria, we are now starting to get to the, the point where the rand is fairly valued on existing circumstance. Once the new economic policies can be implemented, once uh, the um, National Development Plan uh, starts getting dusted off and starts being put in there. Once we see foreign investors bringing their money where their intentions lie, uh, the RAND could strengthen further. So it's no longer a, a one, it never is a one, uh, a one way bet. But even at these levels, it does have uh, room for further appreciation. Thanks, Eric. I just want to know how, does, how do we get the ratings downgrades reversed? Well, you don't get them uh, reversed because they've been downgraded. But what happens is that you now install uh, or install the correct policies and the ratings agencies then come forward and make a decision. Remember, ratings agencies, what they're doing is this, they are deciding on whether or not you're going to be able to meet the debt repayments and the interest repayments on your debt. So if you have a higher risk or if there's a higher risk of default and there have been defaults in the past um argentina which is uh, which is now growing its way back up the ladder uh, it had 40 years or the international borrowers are going to expect you to pay for the money that's the price of the money and that is determined by the ratings agencies will the ratings agencies um, reverse and make South Africa investment grade again they were I, I think we're going to have to see concrete evidence uh, rather than talk before that happens but it's the first step is to stop the negative watches because what would happen in the ratings agencies they downgrade you and then put a, what's happened to South Africa they've been we've been downgraded with a negative watch, which means that the next um, the next up, update, they downgrade you again uh, because there's a negative watch. You want now to just turn those negative watches into neutral or even positive, and that will require neutral will probably come at this point. So in other words, you're not downgraded another notch. You just stay where you are, and then as the concrete evidence comes through, the likelihood there is that you'll get upgraded. But there are many challenges. Let's not uh, underestimate. Um, we've had 10 years of m very bad economic management. We've had the debt to GDP ratio, uh, which has just ballooned. Uh, we've had state owned enterprises that are on the verge of bankruptcy. We've had looting on a scale uh, that was only seen uh, previously in Brazil, and they've put uh, more than three dozen uh, very powerful people in jail as a consequence of it. There is a lot that needs to be reversed. Uh, before people like ratings agencies are going to say, fine, South Africa, we love what you've done. We now believe that you are on the right track and uh, we believe that you're investment grade again, which is uh, investment grade is the level where essentially uh, massive pension funds around the world can put their, uh, put their pensioners' uh, money into those, into those bonds uh, or securities of the countries involved and not be concerned that they're going to lose it. Thanks, Eric. Just two questions to close off with. Um, the first one is, aside from SA, any new tech themes come out of Davos? Uh, CNN was saying earlier today that AI, artificial intelligence, was a hot topic. 
but there were concerns about China's technological progress in this field and others. Uh, just some comments on new themes. Yes, uh, artificial intelligence is a is a hot topic indeed, and uh, it's it's funny this year in Davos it was almost like the Donald Trump story, uh, and then there was also from from our perspective the South African story. It was a it was a sensational South African story, uh, and Donald Trump is sensational no matter whether you like him or hate him. Uh, in between that, the the normal themes continue. So the the progress in areas like blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, it, it continues apace. The the other big story that I haven't mentioned, that was big there, was the the antagonism towards big tech. So more and more, we are seeing countries are aligning themselves against uh, the the power that Facebook and Google in particular have uh, over our, uh, well, by using their artificial intelligence to get to know us better as individuals. So that's a, that's a theme. It, 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 I'm not nervous enough yet to sell Google and Facebook shares, but there is a definite marker, there's a definite flag that's being waved there. Uh, George Soros, incidentally, in his talk, um, and I haven't even mentioned that, but again, that's up on Biz News or Transcript. Uh, in his talk, he focused on on two areas. He, he spoke about the whole world. He thinks Trump is 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 a danger for the world. By the way, um, and then he also focused on the other big area, which is big tech. And what we're seeing increasingly is that Google and Facebook are using our information. In other words, the users of those products, uh, and that's why they can give it to us for free because they're using that information to have an advantage by using artificial intelligence in uh, uh, selling to us. Now, where do you draw the line? How much of our private information should they uh, be entitled to? Indeed, should they be not paying us for that private information? These are the big debates that are going along, along now and are starting to emerge in Davos. Um, the, the, the fourth industrial revolution is still very much on everybody's minds, the changing in jobs, uh, the, the, the decisions, on where we should be upskilling. Um, and all of those issues are, are as before, as you would anticipate in the years ahead. But, but those themes of, of attacking big tech, um, artificial intelligence, just getting more and more integrated into our societies uh, and the economy generally in a good place for the moment, but it's a cyclical upswing. In other words, like a normal cycle, it'll, it'll peter out at some point in time. Um, those are, are kind of the big, uh, the big issues. And just to close off, Alec, um, both Peter and Gavin want to know where you'll be presenting and when. And then Gavin has the little, please give your 2018 pick stocks today, just in case he can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, these are, um, these are what Standard Bank, it's, uh, I'll be in, Cape Town on the 7th, in Johannesburg on the 8th, and in Durban on the 12th <clears throat> with Standard Bank. So it's Cape Town 7th, uh, Johannesburg 8th, and Durban on the 12th. And those uh, events are open to Business Premium subscribers. Um, we have a few tickets that Standard Bank have kind of given us, and uh, also to, uh, obviously, to Standard Bank clients. So we'll, uh, we'll confirm all of that in the next couple of days, Stu. I, I think we, we might need to have some kind of a lottery uh, for the business premium subscribers, but it is, a, uh, it is one of those benefits that you get. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, I think that's there, are other, there are other presentations as well that I'm doing, but those are more, uh, more closed. So those are, the, those are the three, as far as this um, uh, webcast is concerned. And don't forget tomorrow, uh, we have got our global portfolio update. So please, uh, if you're interested in our global portfolio, and who isn't, because it's been growing at over 30% a year for more than three years now, um, then uh, join us again tomorrow, same time. Uh, make a date. You won't be sick of me by the end of tomorrow, I'm sure. But uh, hopefully there's, there's a bit more knowledge that'll help. Excellent, Alec. I think that's it from us. So thanks a lot for your time. I'm glad. It's worth self and Gareth to double. So I think the feedback was fantastic on the website. So, and you've, you've summed it up quite well here for us. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Julia. It was another year. Uh, and Gareth.
Gareth was an absolute star. Uh, Gareth uh, Fontel, my colleague from Biz News, he, it was his first time there, and he had four eyes, uh, which is quite good for a boy from the East Rand. And uh, he then also uh, did some terrific, uh, terrific interviews, and and had a great time all around. So lots of knowledge there. Uh, I'm sure he's really looking forward to going back again next year. And there's lots on Biz News. So uh, if you want a little bit more supplementary information, if you like, uh, we really did. Uh, produce a lot of content for you there uh, and uh, look forward to getting back to SA. Uh, it's not so cold anymore here, Stu, I must tell you that the weather's already uh, perking up a little. I mean, we're getting above 10 degrees, would you believe? So uh, in Davos, it wasn't that cold either. I think we had six or seven degrees in a couple of days apart from the beginning, which was very, very chilly. So it'll be, but it'll be always lovely to come back to some sunny South Africa and look forward to seeing you guys next week. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. So long then.